This is a Stirling engine. And, which is more, it's a Stirling engine. Now, some of you might be thinking, what's a Stirling engine? Well, this is. Ah good, you've stayed for more detail. I like that, because a lot of people think that if they have a label for something, then they actually know what that thing is, whereas in fact all they've really learned is a label for it. Now, a Stirling engine is a type of engine that, uh, well, there was a time uh, shortly after its invention in 1816 by one Robert Stirling, after whom it's named, uh, that people thought, well, this is going to revolutionise the world, and people thought that maybe the Industrial Revolution was going to be powered with these things. Uh, instead it happened with steam engines, but uh, you know, these things could possibly have powered the Industrial Revolution. Um, now, imagine some of you are thinking, what's powering it, though? I, 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 hear, no, I hear no engine running. I hear uh, not the, ex the, the, the vroom, vroom, vroom of, of, of the explosions of an internal combustion engine. I don't see any steam or exhaust. So what is powering this engine? What is causing this flywheel to go round and round at such a staggeringly slow speed? Well, what, in short, is behind the white piece of card? Right, what we have here is a plastic tub filled with ice. Now, some of you may think, hang on, it's ice powered? That's brilliant! Oh, that's so tremendously cool, an engine that's powered by ice. I mean, just think, you just stick it in, in, on an ice sheet in Antarctica and free energy. Well, I, it's not quite that simple. And others of you who have done more physics at school might be thinking to yourselves, hang on, you can't power an engine using ice. I mean, it's, the ice isn't actually in it. It's just using the coldness of the ice to power the engine. But how can you power something with coldness? Because coldness isn't a source of energy. Coldness is, is a symptom of a lack of energy. When I put my finger on something cold, I'm losing heat to it. Heat is coming out of my finger into it. It lacks energy. Cold is what we feel when we encounter something that doesn't have very much energy in it. So how can you power an engine with a lack of energy? Well, you sort of can. And then again, you sort of can't. You see, you could say that this is coal powered coal powered because yeah coal was shoveled uh, onto the massive conveyor belt in the power station where it was burnt created steam which turned the turbines which generated electricity which then came to my fridge freezer which then froze the ice and all that energy created a temperature gradient you see there are two steel plates here one at the bottom and one at the top and this engine runs off the difference in temperature between the two plates. So if you cool down the bottom plate, which is what we have actively done using the energy of that coal, um, then you get an engine that runs. But you can actually run one of these off heat. And even better is a combination of heat and cold, making one plate hot and the other one cold. And it doesn't matter if which one is the hot, which of the top or the bottom is the hot one, and which the, the cold, it'll still work which is rather nice and rather useful. So, the Stirling engine, ladies and gentlemen, invented, as I say, in 1816, and by 1843, the iron foundries of Dundee were powered by these. So, this is a flywheel, which is fairly heavy, has a bit of mass, so as that goes round, uh, you can attach a fan belt to something that can then turn a crankshaft that can power a machine that does good. It, you, you go from, from flywheel to good. Um, and you could perhaps power a locomotive, only they didn't. They used steam power in the end. But in the early days, a lot of people thought these would take over, and they have a number of advantages over steam. Uh, well, for one thing, I'm, I'm not being hit in the face by lots of steam. For another thing, they're very, very quiet, which is rather nice. And they don't involve a high-pressure boiler that might explode and kill me. Now, early steam engines did an awful lot of exploding and killing people and scolding others. Um, so uh, it was uh, very appealing to have an engine which didn't do that. Um, but steam engines just created a bit more power, particularly when they got big. Uh, so if you wanted to power a really massive liner to go across the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, for instance, Stirling engines, eh, maybe they weren't quite the way to go. Um, they are for their power output a bit heavy. Now, for efficiency, they can be very good. They, they can reach as much as 50% efficiency, which is about the same as a diesel engine. Wow, you might think, that's amazing. Only if you have a Stirling engine and a diesel engine of equal power, um, 
the uh, Stirling engine will weigh an awful lot more. And so if you want to put one on anything that moves, like a car, or even more, something that has to fly, like an aircraft, then maybe these aren't the engines for you. Uh, although, thanks to advances in uh, modern materials, in 1986 it was shown as possible to fly an aircraft powered by a Stirling engine. Wow, it's going really slowly now. Um, Yes, uh, in, oh no, in 1986, that, that's what's probably happened is the temperature difference has, has evened out. The cold of this ice now has percolated through and, and cooled the, the, the top plate. But maybe if I warm the top plate just with my, with my fingers, that might be enough to get it going again. God, yes, there you, there you go. Okay, so it's now being powered by the heat of my hand. And um, at the moment, it's generating something like one watt of energy so yeah not very much not very impressive but this is just a, a toy demonstration version of a, a sterling engine rather than the, the, the full throttle thing uh, anyway so uh, yes 1986 uh, a plane that uh, weighed all of two and a quarter pounds that's about a kilo uh, flew for an amazing six minutes it didn't do any acrobatics it just managed to stay in the air and of course this was something far too small to carry a person so don't expect any fighter planes to be powered by sterling engines in the near future um, but it is possible to power useful stuff uh, with one of these, particularly if you want uh, something that's static and on constantly. So if you want to, for instance, uh, power the air in a church organ. Churches traditionally don't move around all that much, and the airflow that you want through an organ is pretty constant. So if you don't mind a very heavy engine, and if it's not going anywhere, just sitting on the ground, that's fine, uh, then a Stirling engine could be for you, because they're very quiet, which is good as well if you want to power a church organ, and there are no emissions, no, there's no exhaust coming off it, which again, you might appreciate, your congregation might appreciate that. So, how does it work? Well, you can see in the bottom here, there is a sealed chamber with the steel plate at the bottom, which at the moment is very cold, and one at the top, which is room temperature. And between the two, you can see this um, disc, which is a thick insulation foam disc, which is going up and down. Why is it going up and down? Well, there are actually two cranks on the top of this, and one of them, this one here in the centre, is pulling that disc up and down. And the other one is being driven by this piston. So this is the, the, the power uh, crank, if you like. This is what's actually driving the wheel round, and this one is pulling this insulation disc up and down. So what's this insulation disc doing? It's known as a displacer. It displaces the air in the chamber. Well, in this chamber there is air. And when, I'm going to stop this, and you can show how incredibly low power it is, I just stop it with my finger like that. So when the uh, disc is at the bottom like that, it insulates the air in the chamber from the ice, which means that the, um, the air can then heat up. When this cranks round to the top, this then insulates the, uh, the air from the warmer plate and exposes it to the colder plate, so it cools down. So the air in this chamber is cooling down and then warming up and then cooling down and then warming up and then cooling down and warming up. Now, why is that significant? Well, as air cools down, it loses energy. The molecules in it don't rush around so much, and so they don't bang off the sides of the, uh, the sealed chamber nearly so often, which means that they exert less pressure. And if they're exerting less pressure, then the atmospheric pressure in the room can push this uh, piston down. And uh, this then turns the flywheel, which has got a bit of momentum, which then causes this to pull the disc up to the top, no, sorry, push it down to the bottom, uh, which means that it can then have the chill knocked off it. Now, at the moment, I'm not actively heating the top, but the, the room is reasonably warm, and so that's enough to um, speed the, the molecular movement, the Brownian motion, if you like, of the, the molecules in the air, and they then uh, exert a greater amount of pressure, and then the whole system is reset because the momentum carries the wheel round again, and then it goes back down to the bottom, the air does, and it then ooh, chills again, and then the air pressure in the room pushes this down. So, at the moment, the, the air pressure in the room is pushing this down, pushing this down, pushing this down, pushing this down. So it's being driven by the air pressure in the room pushing this down over and over and over again. Notice I'm just pushing this down, I'm not pulling it up. And because, because it's got a flywheel on it, oh, I actually had it going the wrong way, wrong way it doesn't matter. Um, 
because it's got a flywheel on it, the momentum brings it up again. So I'm not pulling it up, I'm just pushing it down. Um, if you had something hot down here, that would be heating the bottom, and the air would then be, be getting greater than atmospheric pressure, and that would be pushing the piston up. So it would be driving the thing on the upstroke rather than the downstroke, and it would go the other way around. It would go the other way around because these two cranks are not actually uh, at 180 degrees to each other. They're at more like uh, about 90 degrees. Um, so there's only a 90 degree delay, which means that it travels in one direction for cold and another direction for hot. I think we should try this with something hot, don't you? Bam. Right, so I'm back and now I'm going to fill this rather beautifully coloured mug hey. with some hot water right to the very brim like that and then I stick on my Stirling engine and we'll see how long that takes to get going. Now sometimes they can take a bit of encouragement to get going. Oh, oh, there we go. And we're away. And you can see that it's going a fair bit faster than it did with just the ice. So the temperature gradient between this very hot water and uh, the steel plate now at the top. So now the top is the cold plate and the bottom is the, uh, is the hot plate. The temperature gradient is clearly quite a bit more because it's going around quite a bit faster. So the bigger the temperature gradient, the more efficiently this thing works, which means that they're not terribly good in very hot places. So if you live near the equator um, and the, the, the sun uh, slams down like a hammer out of the sky, baking the land and, and heating all the air around it, then these are not tremendously efficient because you can heat the bottom, but the temperature difference between the bottom and the top won't be so great because of all that sun on the top. Um, whereas if you go into very far northern climes, uh, these work much more efficiently. So if you are, for instance, uh, a company like Google or Facebook, and you're thinking of uh, building an enormous array of servers in a building in northern Finland or something like that, then you might want to stick in a load of uh, Stirling engine because all those servers are going to create a load of waste heat that you want to get rid of and that could heat one side of a Stirling engine which you could mount on the side or the roof of the building and then the the upper plate could be exposed to the icy air of the outside and you'd get a tremendous uh, temperature just difference from your waste heat that's just waste it's going to do nothing otherwise and you could then run loads of Stirling engines off that Another use for the Stirling engine has been found by the Swedish Navy. Uh, since 1996, they've been putting Stirling engines on their submarines. Yeah, think a submarine is, is a sealed unit and you've got a problem with a buildup of heat on the inside. And <coughs> when you're underwater in your uh, submarine, uh, you want to be stealthy because submarines are all about stealth, right? So you don't want a load of bubbles coming out. So a type of engine that doesn't have any emissions is rather good. And you also don't want to create a lot of noise because that's bad. So a quiet Stirling engine that isn't going wrong because of the explosions in an internal combustion engine or because of uh, all that steam and so forth from a steam engine, a Stirling engine can be rather efficient. You've got the heat from the inside of the submarine. And of course, as the submarine moves through the cold waters of the Baltic, you've got cooling on the outside of the submarine all the time as the cold water goes past, uh, which means that you can create, again, a wonderful temperature difference and you get loads of, sort of, free energy. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, it's not free in the sense of breaking laws of thermodynamics, but it's using, it's using a temperature exist, uh, difference that exists anyway in practical senses. So, hey, why not make use of it? Um, Stirling engines have been put to reasonably useful use. It's early days yet, but there's been a revival in interest in these things. Um, in the, the, the clean energy market. So for instance, there are, uh, there are setups in Spain where they've got a dish and the dish has reflective material on it and it focuses onto uh, the hot plate of a Stirling engine that's just a few feet away from it. So you can set one of these up in your back garden. It doesn't have to be enormous and, and focusing beams onto a massive tower that's a long way away. It can be quite small and domestic and you can focus the sun onto the hot plate of a Stirling engine and get a moderate amount of power out of it. But it's they're simple and they're quiet 
And, you know, to some degree, to some degree, let's not go overboard here, but to some degree, these could be the future. Now, can we get this to go any faster? Um, well, of course, we're heating up the uh, the bottom plate, but what if we cool the top plate as well? So let's uh, add some ice, shall we? Uh, so stick some ice on the top. Maybe there'll be a detectable increase in the speed. I don't know. Is that any faster? It is quieter, which is interesting. It's gone quiet. Oh, and now it's going definitely faster and a little bit noisier. Yeah, so there you go. Heat on one side and ice on the other. So imagine in some futuristic fantasy, uh, they set up using technology at the moment, which makes our current technology look puny. They set up enormous power stations. Oh, it's really picking up speed now. Enormous power stations in Antarctica, say. Now, we have reason to believe there's quite a lot of volcanic activity in Antarctica, but we don't know exactly where it is yet and we can't get to it. But imagine that we can. And, and we dig down and, and bury enormous chambers like this in the ground of Antarctica. And these are heated by volcanic heat and the pistons surge up and, and push up into the icy air above, cooling everything down and get the flywheel going around and you get power stations from, from Antarctica and, and that'll be, okay, again, it's still not exactly free energy, but it's, you know, it'll be potentially cheap and efficient. Um, at the moment, all forms of alternative energy have problems, uh, but we're going through a stage of being a bit rubbish at it in order to get better at it. And... The Stirling engine might be a way um, that uh, we improve our energy efficiency. So, for instance, that uh, server array in, in Finland I mentioned earlier, um, they won't be able to run the whole server off the power generated by the Stirling engines. That's absurd because that would require them to be more than 100% efficient. But even if you could, say, generate, I don't know, 30% of the energy you needed to run the array from the Stirling engines in the same building, well, that would be pretty good, wouldn't it? I mean, I imagine that the electricity bill for Google and Facebook is quite large. If you want something to start instantly, then a Stirling engine's probably not for you. Uh, a petrol engine would be much better. Vroom, and it started. A couple of sparks into the, in the spark plug in the chamber, and bang, the petrol explodes, and you're away. Um, uh, but this is quite a lot faster to get uh, working than, say, a steam engine. With a steam engine, you have to spend quite some while building up the steam pressure from nothing. And if it's a very big steam engine, that can take a while. Whereas these, well, you know, they, they start... Mod okay, not very quickly, but but faster than the steam engine, which is good. <laughs> so in the future, some of these might be used for what's known as combined heat and power. So either you have waste heat, which then generates electricity via the stirring engine, or you deliberately create heat, which can also heat something else, like your home, to a comfortable temperature, and generate your electricity, which is all rather nice. And because they are simple and easy to maintain, uh, they can be used at a domestic level. You don't have to make massive power stations out of them. And maybe that's another thing which is, which is good about them, because a lot of other engines are very efficient when they're big, whereas these tend to be more efficient when they're small, up to about the uh, 100 watt, 100 kilowatt size. Um, so if it's true that the future is uh, one in which we can have lots and lots of small power stations and people charging up batteries and then selling each other electricity on some complicated grid, then these could play their part. <laughs> so thank you, Robert Sterling, for inventing the Sterling engine. And it's another first for Britain. Dindy Bear!